Philip Shepard, welcome back to the Plant Yourself podcast. Oh, thank you. Such a pleasure to be here, Howie. It's great. It's great to have it. As, as, I, as I was mentioning before we started recording, I'm, uh, I'm here to get inspired to, to, to do some of the intense weight training um, that we're going to be talking about. And it's, that's less scary than it sounds. Thank you. Yes, um, it is. <laughs> I realized as those words were coming out of my mouth, I think, hey, you know, half the listeners are like, OK, well, I'll skip this one. I'll wait for something more spiritual or more plant based or whatever. But this is this is life changing stuff. Um, so before we get into um, your, your new book, your latest book, Deep Fitness, um, I kind of want to bring people up to speed who may not know you, who haven't listened to our past conversation, because this really when, when I when I saw that you had written a book on fitness, it really seemed like a, a right angle to the work that I, had, that I had known you for. So can you kind of introduce yourself? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, you know, embodiment has been my lifelong passion. And it, it's like been hacking my way through the jungle to, to find the path. Um, and I was deeply, deeply influenced by the East. I went to Japan as a teenager and studied classical no theater, which is the most embodied performing art I've ever encountered. And they, in, in Japan, they revere the belly. Their name for the belly is Hara. And, 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 you know, they have phrases about the belly that we have about the head. Um, so as a teenager, I'm introduced to this deep intelligence in the body and it guided me through my life. So at this point, I've written three books. Um, uh, New Self, New World was my first. Radical Wholeness was my second. And, and I, you know, more important than that in a way to me is that I've got over 150 practices that I've developed to help heal this divide, this sundering between our thinking and our being. So we've been systematically taught that we can think more clearly if we sort of shut down the noise below the neck and just concentrate up here. And it's deleterious to almost every facet of our lives. Mm. So one, th one thing that occurs to me is when you, you, you start out by saying I've you know, devoted my life to sort of embodiment, um, I'm not sure that I really know what that means. And I've studied with you, I've read your book, I've taken a workshop, and I'm certain that for a lot of people it's, it's, it's just you know, a bunch of syllables. Such a, <laughs> such a good point, Howie. So let me, let me offer my definition in a way of embodiment. Embodiment is a state in which the whole of your intelligence comes into coherence with the present. So we fracture our intelligence. I mean, you know, it's one thing to think with the head. It's another thing to feel from the heart. And it's either or within us. Mm. You, you know, it, 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 we, they don't belong together. It's, you know, a gut, a gut feeling. And then there's reason. And, and, and there is this a divide. And, and the legs have intelligence. The, the back has intelligence. So there are all these fields of intelligence within the body that we have cordoned off from one another. So embodiment to begin with is to release the body from the, the prison of those cordoned off intelligences that you feel its intelligence as a whole. But, you know, to feel its intelligence as a whole necessitates an awareness of the present because the body you know, what it most deeply feels is the present. And there is a mindfulness to the present that we join and we are guided by. And that's, that's not possible if you're sitting in your head, taking charge, guiding yourself. Hmm. So you just put me off in my mind on a huge tangent that I don't, I don't think I want to go too far down, but I, I can't not mention it. Because you started off with the with the word coherence with the present, and I have been studying, learning, practicing something called coherence therapy, which is a a kind of experiential 
therapy that I'm applying to my coaching. And the idea is that everyone's behavior, no matter how seemingly self-destructive or other destructive is coherent in that it's based on their understand. It's based on their implicit memories locked in the body. So for example, if I was, um, abused as a child for doing X, I could know that I'm no longer a child. The people who abused me are no longer here. I don't have to, I can, st I can do X now without fear, but the implicit memory in my body is blocking it. And I'm really curious what you've seen around the you know, embodiment in terms of helping to heal the, you know, the, behavioral and psychological traumas that we, we bring from the past and impose on the present when they really aren't present? Yeah, it's such a great question. I'll, 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 I'll avoid the desire to do a deep dive into it, but the way I understand it is embodiment goes through two stages. The first stage, um, you know, my understanding of the body is that it is essentially a resonator, like a singing bowl. <laughs> and it resonates to the present and, and, and attunes to it. And what we've done in our culture is it's basically like filling the singing bowl with sand because we have so many unintegrated energies in the body. We store emotions and lock them up. We store ideas and lock them up. And any, any unintegrated energy is reactive. And, and how, you know, so the first stage of embodiment is to feel those unintegrated energies and begin to integrate them, to begin to bring them home. And when I talk about bringing them home, I feel the ground of my being in the pelvic bowl, deep, deep, um, you know, to, to the pelvic floor. It's to the pelvic floor I return when I want to attune to the present, when I want to feel my deepest truth. And so the first stage of embodiment is recovering the spaciousness, our natural spaciousness, our natural fluidity within the body. And then the second stage of embodiment is that ability to feel, you know, this is going to sound strange, but to feel empty to the world, that there is room within the body for the world to be felt. Hmm. And, and then I am carried, I am guided. Um, but you can't, you can't get there by deciding to get there. There's a lot of work involved in recognizing the unintegrated energies and, and giving them, I, you know, I feel them as orphans within mm. the body. They've been exiled from this family of our being and they're put on hold. And the, the way an orphan is welcomed into a family is through love, not by demanding or or insisting it is it is love that brings it home and so it is with these energies to to fully accept them to love them and in my experience what what isn't expressed cannot be integrated so mm -hmm. so in in that stage of integration the expression is needed, whether it's rage, whether it's sorrow, whether it's grief, whatever it is. Once the expression has happened, then that energy can be brought home and mm. integrated. And that integration, it's a little, do you know what a murmuration of starlings is? Um, from your book, I, I remember a photograph in, yeah, in Radical yeah, yeah. Wholeness. It's, it's, yeah, it's these, like a quarter of a million birds flying like an, like an amoeba in the sky and rippling mm. and and you imagine one little starling not part of the murmuration and it's, it's reactive and it's, its flight is unsteady and it finds its way into the murmuration and it is harmonized by the whole. Mm. And that's, that's for me what happens when these orphans are integrated. Mm. And it's so interesting that you're using the words orphans and exiles. I, um, I found my way to this coherence therapy through internal family systems 
which speaks us specifically of exiles as parts of ourselves that have not been integrated and that yes. need to be approached with above all respect and yeah. love and patience. Yeah. Yeah, mm. exactly. So what's, what's kind of mind, and I don't know why, is one of the exercises you had us do, and this, I think it was what, May 2019, it was before or, the craziness, yeah. um, down in, in um, Greensboro, North Carolina. I remember you were asking us to pick up a pen off the floor either like the normal way we would do it, like looking at it and thinking about it or dropping down or dropping our consciousness as best we could into our pelvic bowl and then reaching for the pen. And I remember it, I don't remember the details, but I remember it being a weirdly different experience. Yeah, yeah. So this, this actually pertains to deep fitness because our relationship to the body is like the relationship of someone to a donkey that they're riding. And we tell the body what to do and we beat it to go harder, to go faster. And, and so we, as soon as you treat the body in that way, the body feels mechanical and you are organizing the mechanics to pick up the pencil, for example. What that exercise explored was allowing the body to come into felt relationship with the pencil, for example. And then you're no longer sitting in your head organizing the mechanics. You are carried by that relationship. And, and for me, too, it's mm. a completely different experience. Mm. So, yeah, it felt more... Uh, well, I, I felt, um, I would say less clumsy in doing it, yeah. um, you know, more, more at ease, more at, uh, um, sort of natural. Yes. Like it was like, I mean, I, you know, I do things all the time. I use my body all the time. And I guess a lot of the time it is coming from that place. Cause I'm not sort of monitoring and beating. Like I know if I, if I want to reach for a glass of water, my body can do it. I don't need I can, I can keep, you know, doom scrolling while I drink water. I don't, uh, but to sort of consciously empty the mind and notice how my body responds to its environment, like part of a murmuration, as opposed to a bull in a China shop, which is, you know, I've been accused of that in my life. Uh, so there, so I might just point out that when we come back to the body's intelligence, we come back to what it feels, to what it understands, to, to its realizations. And, and, you know, what the body most deeply feels is the present. What the body most deeply understands is that it belongs. It belongs to the world. It, you know, the, the mm -hmm. tree, when you feel the tree from the body, you feel it as kinship. You feel... You feel family, you, these living beings sharing this moment together. And what the body most deeply realizes is that everything is alive. And so coming back to that, to that pencil, when you're really feeling the pencil from the body, um, there, is a, there is a living relationship between you, its presence and your presence are brought into harmony. Um, mm. And, you know, the more deeply I drop into the body, the more deeply I feel the aliveness of everything around me. Mm. I, I wrote down the body belongs to the world and put it in quotes. And <laughs> um, we were talking before we started recording about, you know, this and that, the weather and the, the wildfires that you've been experiencing in, in your home country of Canada and the wildfires that they're raging here in Spain. And a lot of the story that I hear from people and that I kind of, you know, buy into is that my body doesn't belong here, that I'm the problem, that, that me and my civilization is... Like, does, we don't have a right to do this to the earth, we don't, and which um, cascades in 
like, we don't belong here. Like I'll go for a hike and like, I'll see trash and I'm like, Oh, it'd be so beautiful if it wasn't for me and my fellow humans. Can, can the body belonging have a, have a, a role in that conversation? Yeah. I mean, I think what doesn't belong is, is not the body, but our relationship with the body. So we have a tyrannical relationship. We have a top down relationship with the body and there is no, no relationship that is more primary than your relationship with the body. So that relationship becomes the template for our other relationships with the trees, the grass, the sea, the air. And we have a tyrannical relationship, an exploitative relationship with the earth that to which we seamlessly belong, on which we depend for absolutely everything. And that, to me, is the, the canker in our culture, is this dissociation of our thinking from our being, this top-down relationship, not with the body, but with the world around us. And to, so to come home to the body is to disencumber yourself of the assumptions and uh, drive to consume and and anxiety that are held in place by this dissociation and you come home to belonging and caring and a sort of sensitivity to what is around you. Mm. Wow. I'm, I'm going to think about that next time I'm, uh, I'm hiking up, up in the, in the mountains near my home. Yeah, we, 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 we live with such entitlement. And I, you know, I think entitlement is one of the, one of the darkest states of mind that we can be sucked into. Yeah, like when I, when I, you know, sold my house, I sold its title. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah. Uh, so, so at this point, I want to do a, a, the pivot and, okay, so like now I'm going to tell the listeners, this guy, who we've just been talking about this stuff, we're going to talk about working out, right? Which is when I first saw, heard that you had written this book, Deep Fitness, I'm like, well, that's weird. <laughs> like, I, I don't even know, like, <clears throat> like given, what, what, are you, what are you going to add to like the world of workouts? And I started reading the book and the first thing that hit me, because you, you come in soft, right? You don't come in with like all the, the, the deepest consciousness embodiment stuff. You just talk about what we know about sarcopenia, which is muscle loss. And within three chapters, you had convinced me that not exercising the right way is as much or more of a threat to our health as my... Um, focus on diet, on, you know, avoiding crap and eating healthy stuff. Um, so maybe we just, you know, start there as a, as a soft runway into, into deep fitness. Um, first of all, what, what made you interested in even writing the book and even exploring this when you've got such a gig, good gig going in the embodiment world? And... Yeah, I mean, I, I got an email from my co-author, Andre Yakovenko didn't know the guy, and he said, "We have this mutual friend who um, um, spoke highly of you, and and uh, you know I, I'd love to introduce you to my workout in my gym." And uh, you know I, I've never been much one for gyms, uh, you know, <laughs> but I'm up for anything. So I went in, and he's the one who introduced me to this workout at his gym, New Element Training. And I fell in love with it immediately. And let me talk, let me describe the workout. He, he has a, a gym with machines. They're Medex machines, which are the best machines I've ever worked on because they, they adapt to your body. You can adjust them and, and they, they allow you to target muscles without straining anything else. And the workout is very simple. Say I'm in a chest press machine. I move the weight slowly. I lift it and I lower it. And I'm just going 
slowly and within a minute and a half, maybe two minutes, I get to the point where I can't move it. My muscles reach momentary failure and I'm trembling and holding it and finally it lowers itself. So I've reached the point of momentary muscle failure and there are huge advantages to reaching that point. And then I move to the next machine. I don't need to do a second set or a third set. There's no benefit to doing more sets because, because I've reached that point of momentary failure. So in, in half an hour, you can bring all the major muscle groups of the body to momentary failure because it only takes a minute and a half or two minutes. Like that's the sort of target window to, to reach mm-hmm. failure. <clears throat> if you're reaching failure sooner, you add more weight. If you're, uh, I mean, if you're, if you're reaching failure sooner, you decrease the weight so you can go longer. If you're going to three minutes, then you increase the weight, which will bring you back. And um, uh, Andre had invited me to his gym because he'd heard from our mutual friend um, that I was... Uh, well, as, as his friend said, an expert in mindfulness, and he lives in your city, you should get in touch with him. And Andre <clears throat> had been told by this friend that the workout was a mindful workout. And Andre said, what's, what's mindfulness? And hmm. so he was getting into it and was loving it. And I trained Andre in my modality, which is the embodied present process. And he took the facilitator's training and took workshops. And meanwhile, he was training me in his modality, which is this high-intensity training. And our two modalities sort of dovetailed because, because this workout is so slow, you can be fully present to what is happening in the body. It is an utterly present, mindful experience. And I, you know, personally, every workout is, is a spiritual practice. I don't know how else to say it. I'm so deeply resourced in the whole of my being that it's the time in my week when I am most fully alive. So for me, before I read this, like I know I'm supposed to be mindful And like, you know, I go for a run and I probably shouldn't be listening to books on tape or podcasts, but it's so boring and so uncomfortable. And the taking my mind out of it just makes it so much easier. And and specifically when I've done, you know, weight training or, you know, high intensity stuff with weights, whether it's, you know, it's got more of a cardio or or a strength element. This is something to absolutely get through. (laughs) to endure, you know, and, and I have to say, I don't, I don't really have the experience of, I don't think I've had the experience of it, anything being anything close to spiritual or enjoyable or anything that I'm doing other than for some other purpose in the future. Like it really is pain now for benefit later. Yeah. It's the opposite for me. My body craves that return to the gym, that aliveness. And one of the, one of the, the couple of things that make that possible. Um, We traditionally have this top down relationship, like somebody riding a donkey, beating it to go faster. So we are in a state of self conflict and that hurts (laughs) hurts <laughs> and the mm. harder you push the body the more it hurts so it's a it's like picking up the pencil it's a very different thing to drop down like to actually drop the center of your awareness to come to rest in the body and to feel your core and then the breath becomes like a piston and it's the sense that the breath is moving the weight and it's a it's a very and and there's all the difference in the world between what we're used to, which is blowing the breath and 
that deep, feeling the breath deep in the pelvic floor and feeling that breath stream support the weight. And as I approach failure, instead of becoming more aggressive and more willful, my awareness becomes more subtle. And it's like, oh, that's interesting. My body has has stopped. It's pushing. It just can't push anymore. And I find a subtler level and I get a little nudge. And I find a subtler level still and another I can I can pulse. And so that as I as I approach failure, there's just this pulsing. And it's such for me anyway, it's such interesting territory to explore. It is the deepest encounter with the self to play along that edge of failure and find one more little push, one more little pulse until I can't. And then there is such a wave of bliss once I drop the weight. It's like if there have been any frustrations or niggly emotions or anxieties, they have gone. I have, I have moved them through my body, and I there's an, there's there's this state of pure being where I I don't need to do anything. I don't want to do anything. I just I just am in this sort of avalanche of sensations in the aftermath and then I go on to the next machine oh. so h- how long does this take half an hour to to get through a, a total body workout and if you mm. do that once a week you get stronger and stronger and stronger now I do it twice a week because that accelerates the strength gain. And, you know, how I'm still getting stronger. I've been doing it for almost six years. And it's not that I got stronger and, pla- and, and stopped. I mean, it's, the, the strength gains have slowed down. But I can see every week, oh, my time, I'm three seconds longer. I'm 10 seconds longer, whatever it is. And, you know, I time myself and write it down every week. And then, you know, I get over two minutes and I increase the weight a little bit. So Hmm. 20 years ago, if I had imagined myself at 70, I think my hope would have been that I I wasn't (laughs) wasn't (laughs) deteriorating too quickly. And Uh the reality is I'm getting stronger and stronger still. And there, there are principles in the book that that um, address that, that show why it's possible. Mm. Now, you say, so once or twice a week, does that mean that three times, four times, five times is better? Good question. When you're exercising, your muscles are getting weaker. It's when you leave the exercise that your muscles remodel and get stronger. That remodeling takes two to three days. If you, if you go back and, and take that same muscle to failure before the remodeling happens, you've interrupted the remodeling. And you can act, I mean, there's a, there's a it's cited in the book, uh, an instance where uh, a hockey player was getting, in, in the intense training that, that he was undergoing, he was getting, he was losing muscle mass because the training was so frequent. So the recovery is as important as the exercise. The, mm-hmm. the exercise stresses the muscle with, it's called hormesis. Um, the, hormesis is a positive stress to the body that incites um, adaptation. And intense exercise incites adaptations that... Um, counteract all the chronic diseases that we associate with aging that stimulate a rejuvenation of the mitochondria. I mean, the, there's this global effect that exercise has on the body, and it's the intensity of the exercise that does that. 
So, mm. so to, to go five times a week to the gym counterintuitively is counterproductive. There's a, there's a, a, a weightlifter, uh, Mike Metzner, I think, who, who talked about his frustration. He was, he was working out four to five hours at the gym every day. His bodybuilder ended up Mr. Yeah. Universe or something. And, and, and it wasn't working. And he had a phone call with Arthur Jones, who was really one of the pioneers of this form of exercise. Oh, the, the Nautilus guy. The Nautilus guy, the guy who developed Nautilus. Brilliant, brilliant guy. And, and, and Arthur Jones said, well, you're working out too often and you're working out counterproductively. Don't do three sets, do one set, but do one set to failure. And then rest, let your muscles restore. And then come back three days later. And that, that phone call changed his life because he was about to give up. He was so frustrated. I mean, how much more can I do? I'm doing four and five hours a day at the gym. I, I can't do more and it's not working. So, so one of the things that I got from the book, and I don't know if this is right or if it, if it was in there or I just sort of, you know, filled it in, was that like this idea of one set to failure, and then you don't have to do it again for a couple of days. You don't have to do three sets. Like, cause so much of my workout had been, you know, like five, four, three, two, one to do pyramid stuff. Or, okay, now you're tired. Now, wait, you know, wait until you can do another 10. And what, what I got from it is that what you're really doing, if, if it's just volume builds muscle, then my way works. But you're, I, what I thought you were saying was that you're actually just giving an instruction to the muscle. You're, you're giving it information. You're, you're, you're presenting it with a, with consciousness and it knows what to do with that. And you don't have to keep giving it the message. Did I, did I make that up or is that in there? No, no, no. The, the purpose of the exercise is to stimulate an adaptation to make the muscle stronger. Now there's a principle. I talked about some of the principles. There's a principle, the overload principle that says, if you're taxing the muscle in the same way, then, then it, it won't be stimulated to get stronger. You have to overload it. Overloading it means taking it to failure. It cannot do the work anymore. So you take it to failure, it's stimulated to adapt. That's all you need. You're just trying to, you're just trying to offer it the stimulus to adaptation. And, you know, the the traditional workout where you're oh, doing you know 12 reps and then you and then you rest the, the it tends to be a, an explosive movement that generates a lot of momentum that means that you're not working the muscles through the full range of the mo of the movement so they've mm. they've found that you know, you're, you're working a lot at the beginning and then the momentum takes over. So, so if you're moving the weight, I mean, what we recommend is at least four seconds lifting and lowering, um, at a, at a minimum. I, I, I do, um, I'll tell you about my workout, which is if I'm on, again, on the chest press machine, I'll, lift the weight, and then I lower it over 30 seconds. 30 seconds is a long time. Mm. And then I get to the bottom of that, and then I lift it over 30 seconds. And when you're lifting it, 30 seconds is even longer. And then I lower it for 30 seconds. So that's a minute and a half in all. By the end of that, of that negative phase, I am generally at my limit and then i and then i do that pulsing i just stay there and go deeper and deeper into the subtlety of what is still there rather than the coarse willfulness of 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 pushing it mm. gotcha so the the first thing that really confused me so if you, if you had told me that Philip Shepard, the author of Radical Wholeness, was going to write a book about working out, I would, I, would have, I would have bet my IRA that it would have been a whole body workout, 
right? And some of you, you're talking about MedEx machines or Nautilus about isolating muscles. And I'm like, that was a surprise. <laughs> so, so just to say, when I'm doing the workout, I'm doing it from my wholeness. So, so, you know, say I'm doing a, like a, a chin up. I am deep in my core, um, deep in that still center that I feel in the pelvic bowl. And it is that relationship, my wholeness, that is pulling that bar down. So I'm not, I'm feeling the muscles, um, you know, sort of so much is happening, but the impulse is from my wholeness. I am, hmm. I am at rest in my body. And, you know, I talk, we talk in the, in the book about the difference between willpower and intention. So I am allowing this intention to live through my body rather than flipping into my head with this imperative that, that, that turns the practice into something willful. Hmm. So that even, even if you were isolating the the pecs or the, the, the chain that pushes something um, let's say away from you know a, a pushing motion in a, in a lateral direction um, the whole body is is involved and engaged the body uh, the body is not compartmentalized is another way of saying it so I'm not sitting in my head moving the arms you know, sitting on this bench, I, I am fully present to what is passing through my body. And, and, you know, you know, my, my definition of embodiment, um, is a state in which the, the whole of your intelligence comes into coherence with the present. The whole of my intelligence is present to this, this pushing, this lifting of the weight in the, in the chest press, it's not, it's not that I've got a, um, an imperative in my head that is making my body do it. It's that my body is, is being summoned into a necessity that it meets and answers. Hmm. So I know what, one, one of the phrases that you like to play with is like, listen to your body, which is, what I have always, you know, have mostly failed to do around, well, it's Tuesday, I got to do my workout. Yeah, I don't really feel like it. Well, should I listen to my body? Should I do it anyway? Should I take it easy? Should I modify it? First of all, it's, you know, I gave you the setup for listen to the body. So I'd love, I'd love your rejoinder for that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's our culture. Our culture for millennia has been devoted to the head, has been separating, dissociating from the body. So when we, when we think, oh, we should get back in touch with the body, it's like the best we can do is to listen to the body. And if you're listening to the body, that's not embodiment. If you're listening to the body, it's, it, it's accepting in some way, the metaphor that th there's a wall <laughs> separating you from the body, and the best you can do is put your ear to the wall to find out what's happening on the other side of it. So <laughs> that's, you know, as a, to have encountered Hara in Japan as a teenager and to, you know, experience that deep seated intelligence of the body, you know, in a way, my work is not about listening to the body it's about listening to the world through the body it's about that attunement and so it's not to say there aren't times when listening to the body is important like if i'm injured i will i will attend to that injury in in, a, in the way of listening i i i i'm i i am pulled away from the larger present into this need to be with and give love um and you know even in in clearing some of those orphans some of those unintegrated energies there are times where it's yes listening to the body but but it's a it's a 
stage on the way to embodiment and you know mm. it's, i think it's dangerous to mistake it for embodiment so so you know when i'm doing the workout there may be a part of me on a particular day that says oh god i'm not up for this but if i drop into my body if i you know literally drop my awareness to the perineum I encounter a simple indifference <laughs> that is fully ready for whatever the present brings my way. Mm. And I just do it mm. w without, so, without, without the aggro of self-conflict. Mm. Now, to, to someone who's just hearing that, indifference can sound pretty cold and detached. I'm guessing that's not what the experience is. No, I mean indifference in the way of, of. You know, um, we have all these personal anxieties, and and and. You know, if you if you, um, don't feel like doing it, but you push yourself to do it anyway, it hurts. So the indifference, you know, I'm using the word in a in a, with a slightly different flavor. It is, the willingness to be with everything. Um, mm. So, so it's, it's, um, you know, it's like that word, um, you, you want a judge um, to be disinterested. Mm. And disinterested is a completely different word from uninterested. Uninterested means you, you could care less. Disinterested means you don't have a stake in the outcome. Mm. And so that indifference is like, disinterested i i can go through this and i can i can meet meet whatever whatever it carries me into mm. gotcha. so the other thing that i circled as you were talking was when you were talking about the coming down slowly uh with the with with the load that you're you can feel trembling um so I, I interviewed a David Berselli uh, a couple a year ago, who does tremoring as a means of yeah. of helping people come back into their bodies. Is is there any connection between the, the trembling that can happen when you're you know approaching muscle failure and the kind of tremoring that let's say a, a gazelle would do after escaping from a predator to kind of clear its nervous system? I mean, I. I I can only speak from personal experience on this. I, you know, I, I hesitate to make any any <laughs> grand generalizations about it, but but the I mean, what what Berselli is is doing um, with his um, active release therapy uh, trauma TRE um, is allowing the body to do what it needs to, like putting it into this state of, of um, disorganization in a way. It's no longer being controlled, and when it's no longer being controlled, then what needs to come through can come through. So in my workout, there's a similar thing because I'm, I'm yes, in a way I'm controlling it, but in another way I'm not, I'm riding it. And... When I'm in my core doing the workout, um, it's a little, it can be a little like a bioenergetics experience. I don't know if you're familiar with that, mm. where, where you're, you're, you're like, mm. you've got a tennis racket and you're beating a pillow and yelling. Uh -huh. Well, my core will, will, you know, I, it can get noisy. It's not, uh. it's not like this placid sitting on a, a cushion thing this life is coursing through me and and that is vocalized from my core not not by decision but by necessity and so and so there is a clearing out um with every session that i i feel an affinity between that and and berselli's work for mm -hmm. sure yeah it's funny because as, as you're saying that i'm thinking about Every time I've done the sort of tennis racket or, or punching a mattress against the wall or, or anything like that, whether it's just 
with by myself or guided by a helper or in a group, there's always a part of my mind that's watching the performance or wondering if it's a performance. And when I did the TRE, there came a moment where I'm like, okay, am I doing this? Am I, oh my gosh, I'm not doing this. Yeah. And it sounds like for, for, you know, when you're doing the wake, you've put yourself in a position where it's clear that something is happening, that you're just hanging on for dear life as opposed to directing. And, and the sense is allowing this to pass through me rather than, as you say, doing it myself. It's opening myself to whatever energy is there that can respond to this necessity. And the experience is one of, of, of that energy passing through me. I'm, I'm not doing it. I'm allowing it. Hmm. All right. All right, so, so now I want to come to the part where it's all about me. So um, I just moved to a small town in Spain. I'm sure there's, there's gyms somewhere. I've never liked gyms. Uh, I'm sure New Element is a very different vibe. Um, but, like, can this be done with body weight? Uh, does it have to involve machines? Um, what are... You know, how do I get started? How can people, how can people be, you know, begin to yeah, explore yeah. this? No, thank you for that. There are actually more exercises in the book that um, are, are body weight exercises than machine exercises. So, so the book lays out um, a number of exercises that you can do with machines and, and there are photographs and, and then even more exercises that you can do with body weight. And, the body weight exercises are hugely effective. Um, there's another thing I should mention. Andre, the, the co-author, has a website, newelementtraining.com. And on that website, there's a little resources tab. And if you click on the resources tab, um, you have access to videos of every single exercise in the book where Andre is coaching someone through the exercise. Now, it's, it's a membership, but it costs $10 a month, and you can cancel it at any time. We're just trying to uh, recover some of the costs of the filming. Um, but to actually see Andre coaching mm. someone through the bodyweight exercises brings it to life in a different way. The other thing I should mention is that Andre does, he and his, his staff, his trainers do um, online coaching. So you can be at home and they will coach you through for half an hour through a series of exercises that will leave your whole body trembling. Great, gotcha. Um, so the other thing that I need so having, having moved here, um, there's, there's been a drought for years. So there's no grass anywhere. So my sport is ultimate Frisbee. And if I want to play it here, I have to play it on the beach. And what I discovered very quickly is that a 30-second jog on beach sand is worse than a 10-mile run. So I could not I could not believe how exhausted I was getting yeah. after just running for a few seconds. Um, I've been looking it up because I also can't move like I can on grass. I can sort of plant a foot and cut in one direction and get open. And here I'm just sort of digging myself deeper and people are just running past me. So what I discovered was that the muscles that I've typically used to run only get me in contact with the, with the base layer of sand and that I need a whole different set of muscles. I need the, the hip extensors, I need the glutes. They're apparently not strong enough, and so I have no speed, and I have no cardio stamina for this. Does the deep fitness address cardio, or do I need to do like, you know, running or cardi cardi other cardio workouts in addition if I wanna, you know, be, be ready to compete? Yeah, so the deep fitness, certainly does address cardio if you keep the 
the interval between exercises short. So, hmm. so when you're going to failure on a leg press or a, a wall sit, um, your, your cardio is, is activated. And then if you're already into the next one, 30 seconds later, um, you're, there's a cardio load. So there was a, a study done at West Point Academy um, to test, you know, Arthur Jones's uh, approach to exercise versus the traditional exercise. And, you know, West Point wants its cadets to be as fit as possible. And, and they, so they had these two groups and they had like 60 measurements of, of fitness from flexibility to cardio to strength to like on every single metric the Arthur Jones exercise on the machines improved fitness more than the traditional exercise done by, by the other group and cardio and mm. flexibility were part of that. So mm. absolutely. Um, the, and to understand too, that the, the primary cardio adaptations do not happen in the heart and the lungs the primary cardio adaptations happen in the muscle itself. The, the, when, when a muscle is overloaded, it activates capillarization. You get, because suddenly the, the muscles are needing oxygen and they, you know, and you need new capillaries to deliver that oxygen. Um, there's a really interesting uh, study that, that's cited in the book with cyclists who <laughs> they were they were, they were testing their cardio fitness and there was a group of them and they tested it to begin with and then they cycled um they trained on a ergometer three or four times a week for a month but they only trained with one leg and then their fitness was tested at the end of the month and when they pedaled with the leg that they trained their their fitness i think it was 23% better when they pedaled with the leg that hadn't been trained, it was the same. So the mm. adaptations weren't in the heart and the lungs, which would have supported that other leg. The adaptations were in the muscle itself. Wow. And then they never could go home because they just walked in circles. Yeah, they, they were lopsided. Yeah. yeah it's, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so flexibility, I hadn't thought about that, but that's a huge issue for me, I've had back issues for a long time. When, when me, we met, I don't know if you remember, you gave me a, 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 a protocol for um, plantar fasciitis, which I've, I found a protocol that actually works, except it only works when I do it. So I, I, <laughs> Damn. I've been, a little, I've been a little disappointed. I thought, I, <laughs> I, I, I thought it was going to be better than it was, but I, it's about 12, 12 minutes twice a week. Um, but does this work? Does the deep fitness like, can that actually address the fact that when I try to, like, you know, bend over that uh, it's hard to tell <laughs> from a distance? Yeah. I, um, you know, the, just to, to, to address flexibility for a minute, there's a, there's a, a form of fitness um, developed by Bob Cooley called resistance stretching. And, and it's, again, so counterintuitive. He says, if you are stretching a muscle, you want to engage it. And so, you know, you're, you're engaging the hamstring as you're stretching it rather than relaxing it. And it's mm. hugely effective. Well, then when you think of lowering the, uh, a weight, your muscles are engaged as they are being extended. They're lengthening as they're engaged. And so that... That's exactly the principle that Bob Cooley uh, works on. And, and I love resistance stretching. It's the only form of stretching I do at this point. Um, the other thing about... Where, where can people find out about it? Is that well, C-O-O-L-E-Y? -O -O yeah, he has a, a web... Yeah, C-O-O-L-E-Y. And um, he has a studio in Santa Barbara that I visited. So I had a, I had a session there, which was fabulous. Um, and he's got a website, the name of which I forget, but I'm sure it would come up if you Google his name. He's also got a book um, about resistance stretching, the name of which I also forget. Um, I mentioned it in Deep Fitness. If you if you were to okay. look up Bob Cooley in the index, uh, you, 
You should should find it there. I'll I'll throw it into the show notes. Yeah, yeah, good. And and there's also an exercise um, in deep fitness specifically for strengthening the back. The what happens with the back is the multifidus muscles get weaker and weaker because they're very difficult to isolate. So there's a an exercise that actually we learned from Doug McGuff, um, where you're lying on your back and you're just arching in a very specific way, arching the lower back and holding it. And you repeat that and, and that strengthens those multifidus muscles to, to help with the back. Awesome. All right. So, um, I have, I have it on Kindle. So I packed light. So, um, I kind of wish I had the, the physical book here It'd be easier to, to look, to stick bookmarks into the, all the exercises. Yeah, um, I should. I mean, I, I just for people who know, they're you know they're the the machine exercises, and and you know we have the body weight exercises, um, and with the Kindle, mm-hmm. there's a PDF that that you should have with it oh. that you can download that has all those exercises in it. No kidding, I have. To, I don't think I saw that. I better check. Oh yeah, you got You need the PDF. <laughs> okay, for sure. Cool. Is is there anything? that you think um, we should talk about that I haven't brought up? The only thing I'd like to mention is that the book is based on research in the last 15 years that hasn't permeated uh, into our sort of common knowledge. And, you know, sarcopenia was discovered that as we grow old, our muscles we're losing muscle mass unless you take uh, counteractive measures. And the most obvious counteractive measure to the loss of muscle mass is strength training. Um, and muscle, we used to think muscle had one primary function, which was to move us around, but it's got two. The second primary function is it, it it's like a hormone factory that muscle creates these messenger molecules called myokines. And I think they've discovered some, something like a thousand myokines that go through the body and affect every organ, every tissue within it and promote health. So, so myokines are basically why exercise is so good for us. The stronger a muscle is and the more intensely it works, the more myokines it produces. So, so, mm. so there is this longevity, there's this rejuvenation that happens through the whole body as a result of these myokines. So what we now understand that people, specialists know, but not the general public, is that muscle is the bedrock of your metabolic health. It's muscle that supports and the working of muscle that supports the health of the entire organism. And so, you know, to give it half an hour once or twice a week um, to know that this form of working out, it's simply the most effective workout I've ever encountered. It works. It just Mm. works. Mm. And so for folks who do belong to a gym or have access to a gym, can they take the book and go just use, use it on the machines that they've got? I, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I travel teaching workshops all over the world and wherever I go, I find a gym and I've worked out on, you know, six different models of, of uh, machines in gyms and, and it works. It, it, it works. Mm. And, and it, we recommend machines because with free weights, if you're doing a bench press and you're going to failure, it gets dangerous. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. But something like a wall set. Absolutely. Mm. You can do anywhere. Right. Yeah. So. And, and to time it, you know, to, to time yourself mm-hmm. and see how long yeah. you go and then come back and you'll notice your time's getting longer and longer. Yeah. So if I can do a wall sit for two minutes and five seconds, do, do I then like hold something heavy or do I like, how do I, how do I uh, graduate 
if I'm not adding you know weights, you, you weights. can you can add weight or you can just go longer. I mean, if you're if you're going five minutes, um, you're you're creating the stimulus the muscle needs to get stronger. I see. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm. It worked. I'm. I'm inspired. Wonderful. Uh -huh. <laughs> Wonderful. It's such a pleasure yeah. to, to talk with you about all this, Howie. Thank oh, you. likewise. Thank you so much for writing this book. So this is, this is one of those cases where like, oh, I know you. I know your stuff. It's amazing in this field. But I'm not really sure if you really, you know, but my gosh, like <laughs> I have as I've shared this with people who have been who are, you know, despairing of getting fit again yeah. because of so many injuries, because of surgeries, um, because of lack of access or because the fitness world has not been welcoming to them. Yeah. Right. Cause they're spiritual people oh, and they yeah. don't want to, oh, yeah. they don't just want to hang out around, you know, people who are pouring hormones and, and steroids into their bodies. And, and the culture of weightlifting is certainly a culture of, you know, power over. Yes. Yeah. And you're, yeah. <clears throat> you're showing strength. Um, and our focus is on uh, developing it. Mm. And it, it, there's a difference. There's a real difference. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So the book is called Deep Fitness. It's got a, a long subtitle that people don't need to know. You're, uh, but <laughs> Deep Fitness. What, what is it? <clears throat> the mindful, science-based strength training method to transform your well-being in just 30 minutes a week. Great. And for people who want to follow you more globally, where where are you found and in producing information? How can people stay in touch yeah, with you? Yeah, thank you for that. My website is embodiedpresent.com. And there's lots of free stuff on there that people can sample and try out. Okay. And I'll say if, if anyone has a chance to go to one of your workshops, they should do it. Nice. I say that from experience. Do you have Do you have any coming up? Yeah, um, I'm in uh, the states. In I've got a five day retreat in Portland. I've got workshops in Asheville and Boise coming up, and uh, one in Alabama in in um, February. And uh, I'm in Europe. If people are in Europe, I'm in Europe in November. In uh, Spain. Well, I'm in England. Um, I'm okay. in uh, Vienna. We, 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 we don't consider England Europe anymore. Yeah, no, I, I understand. Um, I'm, in, I, I'm in Belfast. That's in Europe. Okay. <laughs> Vienna's not that far. Yeah, yeah there you go. There you go. Be a, just okay, so embodiedpresence.com like... and, uh, and, and, and all the books from uh, New Self, New World, Radical Wholeness, and Deep Fitness. This is a, such, such a gift to me and to and to the world, this really is. It feels like a form of acti activism that is, is is a kind that we can do in the here and now, as opposed to the kind of activism that we have to hope somebody votes or somebody shows up. Or there, on my website, there's a little um, piece I wrote called the Embodiment Manifesto, and in it, there's a line something like, "Becoming embodied." is one of the most political acts you can make. Hmm. Yeah. Right on. Yeah. Philip, thank you so much for writing the book and for all the time you spent helping people and for taking the time to talk with me today. I really appreciate it. And I've been looking forward to this and I'm just bas basking. My body is basking in the present joy of connection. Oh, it's lovely, Howie. I, I thank you for this opportunity to talk about something that is so dear to my heart. All right. Be well. Uh, I hope to see you around, maybe, maybe in Vienna. Ah, oh, wonderful. Take care. Right. Bye, Philip. Bye-bye. Oh, thank you so much. It's, it's just so good to get into it.